How did Jeff Wilhelm recruit 5,000 agents in five years? All right, welcome back guys to another episode of All or Nothing in Real Estate. We've got a great one for you here today. I've got one of my good friends, a mentor of mine, a guy that I look up to, a giant in the real estate industry, the one and only Jeff Wilhelms. What's up, man? Hey man, I'm doing I'm doing good. How are you, Matt? I'm doing great, dude. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Um, I, it's, uh, it's great to get together. It's always great to catch up and I'm excited for the knowledge and the information and the value we're going to bring to this audience today. Right on. Let's do it, man. Let's go. All right. So here's the big headline. How did Jeff Wilhelm recruit 5,000 agents in five years? <laughs> well, you know, I, 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 I love that headline, but it, it's, it's actually a little bit distorted, Matt. You know, it's not Jeff Willems and Marcy Willems. It's, it's an entire group of, uh, of, of solid rock solid people that are, that we're working with. And, uh, but you know, it's, it's just, yeah, I guess I could say, uh, five years ago, our good friend Brent Gove called me and, and asked me to talk him off the ledge from leaving his prior company, uh, and joining this company, nobody had heard of before. Uh, and I think at the time they had 800 agents and uh wow. and of course i you know i'm always wanting to help my buddies when they call me and and uh if there's anything that uh, that i can do to poke holes in something to keep them from making a bad mistake i will do that but unfortunately i guess or fortunately as, as it would be uh, i was not able to talk him out of making a bad decision the more i heard about this new company the more i started checking into it i found out that with us owning our own remax franchise uh, and having my coach, Bob Corcoran, take a look at it, uh, we were like, you know what? This looks like something we should uh, be looking at. And it um, took us a month or so to, to, to kind of come to that conclusion that because, you know, having a couple of years left on your franchise agreement, you know, it was like, we don't even know how to unwind this thing that we're in if we want to join this new company. And, and as it turned out, we ended up, uh, you know, not only unwinding the franchise agreement, but uh, we had to pay to get out of it. It was about seventy six thousand uh, dollars, and then probably another fifty or sixty grand to brand our business. And but we figured, uh, what the heck? We we give them six months, and if this no name company uh, turns out to be what everything we thought it was going to be, then we'll stay around for another six months. And I asked my bride thirty seven years ago, Marcy, if she would, uh, you know, I said, I know you're you're saying that. You, you you do, and I'm saying I do until death do his part, but I'm not looking for that commitment from you, babe. I'm only looking for six months. If you think I deserve a six-month contract renewal, then every six months she comes <laughs> back, and I ask her if she wants to go another six months, and and that literally was 37 years ago, so uh, 74 contract renewals, bro. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Congrats, and I, I'm fortunate to know Marcy, too, and you guys are amazing. You're contributors to this industry, to our network. Um, man, 5,000 agents in five years. And guys, if you listen back to what he just said, he didn't take any of the credit. He said it's because he's been able to partner with amazing people. That's the kind of guy that we're talking to today. Um, so other than his accolades of recruiting all these agents and making a, a life-changing decision to change brokerages from the traditional model to an up-and-coming model that had 800 agents, right? Like, think of the guts that takes. I want to really break down crazy it was i'm sorry i mean <laughs> i was with a company that had a hundred thousand plus agents and the biggest brand worldwide at the time remax uh but but yeah it's 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 um i'm sorry go ahead matt <laughs> no man that's that's great so it's like and i want you guys to understand truly like we jumped straight into the five thousand agents but it's not like jeff and marcy were selling two and three houses a year right like you guys had one of the top teams if not the top team in your area in arizona like this was a big decision for you. So let's talk about what did your team look like then versus what does your team look like now? Okay, that's that's fair. Uh, well, back then we had uh, roughly 14 agents on our team. Uh, about four of those agents uh, are really not in a, any kind of a production role. They just have licenses. So all the business was really coming out of about 10 agents. Uh, but we started our journey with Remax back in 2004. Uh, it was just my wife uh, getting started at, basically as a favor to me as a lender uh, at the time. Uh, I asked her if she would 
go get a real estate license so we could legally earn a referral fee. Because <laughs> I was doing a lot of marketing for real estate agents as a lender, hoping that with all these buyers, I was getting pre-approved. And, and then even it turned into sellers that wanted to sell their home because we marketed for free home evaluations online. And people want a free home evaluation for two reasons. They either want to refinance their home or they want to sell their home. They want to know what it's worth to move on. And I found that leveraging those leads with real estate agents was a pretty powerful way to, to get what I wanted, which was their referrals on other clients. Uh, and some would play the game pretty well with me and others would take my referral and end up referring them to their already existing lender. And then they would go uh, close this transaction and then we weren't getting anything off of it. So that's where I asked Marcy that if she could get, a, uh, get her license. And when I referred that business, Matt, to an agent, if they ended up not using our company for the loan or the mortgage referral, uh, then at least she would get a real estate referral off of it. Sure. And so then it turned into that, into, hey, I've got this couple, they're pre-approved. I think you'd be fabulous at taking them out, showing them a home. And uh, the next thing you know, uh, that you know, we're we're showing eight or ten homes out there. Her and I, not really know what the hell we're really doing, but uh, that we had such a great relationship with this couple. Then we brought these people into our broker, who actually Marcy was like, Becky, I've got good news and bad news. And she says, Well, what's the bad news? And I said, Well, the bad news is, I need to write a contract, and I've never written a contract. She says, well, what's the good news? She said, because I got a contract. <laughs> I need to write it. And so Becky, her broker at the time, which is crazy, she's working on our team now today. Wow. Here we are almost 20 years later, 18 years later. But Becky was the kind of person, she says, Marcy, hon, you bring, the, you bring your clients in and you introduce me as your assistant. I'm not your broker. And I'll just act like that it's no big deal. And like we do this every day. And I never have forgotten that. And so, and Becky went to, from Remax to, to, to Long Realty to, you know, she, this lady's been around real estate forever. She uh -huh. sits on the board with the Arizona Association of Real Estate, uh, the Ethics Committee. Uh, uh, she She's in on a lot of these complaints that are filed and, and basically a judge in, in the cases for arbitration and all kinds of stuff now. But um, to, long story short, we started small. It was just Marcy and I. We built it into a, a, a one buyer agent. Then that buyer agent, we got moved to the listing agent side. That buyer agent now today, 18 years later, is our sales manager, Bert Jones. Uh, you know, And then he ended up helping us uh, attract a few more agents and, and so on and so forth. We went up, we went down like any other team. You think you're going to get out of production and then all of a sudden you get drugged back into it because you didn't make all the right moves. We didn't have the culture built. I mean, we've made all the mistakes you could possibly make growing a business. But here we sit almost 8,000 homes later uh, in 18 years. And uh, and it's pretty, it's been pretty much a, a crazy ride in these last... Uh, what does our, our team look like five years ago, Matt? We had 14 agents. We're selling about 400 homes a year. Right now we have about 40 agents and we should do in excess of 700 homes in the next 12 months, give or take this market that we're in a little bit of a correction right now. Sure. But those 14 agents have, uh, have now grown to, uh, like, like we said, uh, almost 5,100 uh, in 13 countries. And, and, uh, and, and it's crazy. It's not just about what we do here in Tucson, even though we're still producing and selling at a high level, it's it's what we're able to do now internationally. And 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 then that heck, that's how we met. You know, I mean, yeah, I think it was Adam Bailey that introduced us. And you talk about a stud. I mean, Adam Bailey and Mike Gerbic working together and having those guys as business partners. And I got to tell you, you know, it's Adam's organization that's half of our growth. So I I can't. You know, I like to think that we help those agents as well, but it's, it's a total team effort. If you're going to grow, it depends on, you know, who you align yourself with, quite frankly. Thousand percent. I cannot agree more. It's uh, the contribution wins in this industry. So a lot of people discount that. They don't understand the power of alignment, you said, and contribution. If you align yourselves with the right people and don't focus on what you can get, but rather focus focus on what you can give, you will get anything that you want in this world. But so you might be people, a little young for this, but I got to yeah. say, it's kind of like uh, Zig Ziglar. You know, I mean, he's an oldie but a goodie. But Zig always said that if you help enough others get what they want, you'll get what you want. I mean, uh -huh. so 
I think we practice that pretty well. We, 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 over the years, there are times that I go, you know what, we need to give more, but I know, I know Chep is that way as well, you know, and, and, and he believes in uh, coming from a, uh, from a place of, uh, of not only just gratitude, but giving of yourself and giving of your time and giving of your resources and your energy and your, and, and your education and you attract people. They want to be in that environment. And that's what we love so much. Um, and I think that honestly, it's the biggest reason we have grown is because people recognize that. Well, people want to be with winners, right? Mm -hmm. But people don't want to be with winners that are greedy, that don't contribute, that keep all their quote unquote secrets to themselves, right? Yeah. And that's what I love about our network and about the circles that I'm fortunate enough to be a part of is that it's truly contribution. It's everything. Like I remember my transition as we were moving our team through some um, obstacles and hoops, like you were right there on speed dial to, to pick up the phone, to help, to do whatever you can to contribute, to help whenever we were having rough times. I've reached out to you. I've reached out to Adam. I've reached out to Brent. I've reached out to Glenn Sanford, right? Like, and they're all willing to help. And so it's, it's so crazy that guys, 8,000 homes in 18 years, like this guy knows real estate. But his biggest secret that he just gave you right there is he always focuses on what can I give? And because of him having that giving heart and that giving personality, he has received far greater gifts than I, I, would, I would imagine that he ever thought was possible because he focused on giving, not getting. Yeah, you know, when I look at the 1099s that we've been issued the last couple of years at EXP, it's mind boggling to me. I mean, it's, it's numbers that I never even thought would be possible in our business, but it's but it's really to be contributed, I think, because uh, we have so many people that are winners and, and, and we have so many people that that get it. You know, I mean, they get it. They know that it's all about coming from a place of giving and they come from a place of love and we're hot. We're giving people hugs and we're not being jealous of each other. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, all of these crazy things, I think a lot of what really helped our team see this too was, uh, and I got to give my coach, Bob Corcoran, uh, a lot of love here back in the day. Uh, Bob does more consulting than coaching now, but the five dysfunctions of the team, as you know, is a really, really big deal. And if nobody's read it or if somebody's listening to this, my biggest advice, if you ever want to read a team uh, or uh, start a team is you need to read a book yourself first, then you need to have that be uh, an exercise that every new team agent does because they need to understand the five dysfunctions of a team. You'll never have a team and gel. We made all the mistakes. Like I said, we had a lot of agents or we, 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 we had a few, then we'd have a lot, then we'd lose people. Then we'd build back up and then we'd lose people. And we still, I'm not going to say that we keep everybody that comes in, but they self I guess they unselect if they don't want to be a part of our, our of, of our culture, and that's okay um, because we don't expect everybody to make the make it the way we have it. But we have the Willems way, and there's the other way. And and I, I truly believe that when you come into our environment, as especially as a new agent, if you can't survive in our market and even thrive in our market in our in our business, then I don't think they got a chance on their own. Because we do so much from from a lead generation standpoint, from a training standpoint, to a and and everything we do, Matt. Here's what's really cool. When I think about 18 years, and I think about all the people that I've leaned on, and listened to, and learned from, and that's why I love giving back. And I'm almost getting tearful tears in my eyes when I think about all the people that gave to me. All we've done is copy what works, man. I mean, there's very little that we do that was Jeff Willems or Marcy Willems originated, man. Our TV commercial ideas came from Russell Shaw up in Phoenix. He was the, the original, you know, monster that, that was on television that we just followed and we knew and he took us under his wing and he gave us guidance that I'm telling you, we never would have figured the TV and radio game out without Russell. Then we come along later and meet a guy named Matt Wagner. And Matt Wagner takes it and steps in and puts it into a whole other gear for us. And, and, and then uh, with radio and television experts. But but be, before even those guys, there was Craig Proctor from Toronto. And, uh, and I would not be in the position we are today with EXP had Brent Gove not ended up becoming one of my best friends. And Brent Gove called me to talk him off the ledge from leaving KW and joining EXP. But guess where I met Brent Gove? 
at a Craig Proctor conference back in <laughs> Toronto, Canada in 2002. I mean, so the Craig Proctor ha has a lot to do with our success. I the very first uh, the very first buyer that Marcy received that I was talking about earlier that I said, honey, we can go sell these people home. They love me. And I told them you're a great negotiator. You're like a barracuda with lipstick. She goes, what? I have never done the first deal. I said, you got to fake it till you make it just a little bit. Come on. You, you got this. We got this. I, it, it's it's going to be easy. And it really wasn't easy, but we still made <laughs> it happen. But guess what? She got a $9,000 commission check in about three weeks because we got these people uh, uh, not only accept a contract, I, I was doing the loan. We stepped on it. She made a $9,000 commission. Then she goes, do you have another one? I mean, it was like that, right? And that was that was seven, like over 7,999 homes or whatever, 8,000 ago. <laughs> but Matt, here's the thing. We never, ever are afraid of taking a chance. We always are willing to step out and, and, and do something that others won't. But I don't look to try to reinvent the wheel. When you can learn from pros, you learn from people that have been there, done that, got the t-shirt. I've learned over the years not to chase squirrels. I call it squirrel chasing. When people yep. have all these great ideas, you find somebody that's sold 3,000 homes or whatever in their career or you know 2,000 or they had their rookie of the year. Well, hey, what are you doing? And uh, you want to know what their successes are. And then you, you, you get together, maybe have a cocktail with them at a conference. You run into them and they start telling you about this thing that they're doing, Matt. And then all of a sudden you're, you're like, well, that's really cool. And then you get all excited. Or I used to. And then I go back and, and then I go, OK, guys, we got to stop doing this. We got to do this. And then we try to shift our team into something completely different. And then I call the agent back about three months later after it's not working. I say, hey, man, so so what are we doing wrong with this thing that you and I talked about at, at this Craig Proctor conference and or at this Mike Ferry event or, or Tom Ferry or or wherever it was? It doesn't even matter. And then, and then they, they, they'll say something like, uh, uh, oh, dude, we stopped doing that a couple of months ago. It didn't, didn't work out. Well, yeah, I thought you built your whole business around it. Oh, no, it was something new. So yep. you got to be good about being able to identify what works and what doesn't work or else you're going to spend a lot of money and waste a lot of money. If you want to learn how to build a team, man, you got to find something that's got a team. Number I one, understand. if I were building a team, I would reach out to somebody like you, which I did, by the way. We were having, we, we needed to have a couple of things the other day, or not the other day, two weeks ago, I was back from Puerto Rico, Marcy and I were, we hadn't seen, we hadn't even met a lot of our new team members. And I knew that jumping back in, I needed to, to do something. And I remember Chip and one of the systems that he had, but you, you reminded me of what that system was, of how to reconnect with our agents and how to get feedback from them and how to deliver it and how to, Holy smokes, dude, I can't tell you in the last two meetings. So we had one two weeks ago and then we had one again yesterday. The team is gelling, baby. They're, they're, uh, and, and many of them were on our team that they did not read the five dysfunctions of a team. And I got to figure out who those people were. You know sure. what it is? We all get busy when the market's running a million miles an hour and it's red hot. But we forgot to get to do the little things. And our That's leadership right. was not having everybody read that book. They weren't having the exercises. They weren't doing daily accountability and tracking. They weren't tracking their, their KPIs on a daily basis manually. They were doing things because the database had them in there. That's what they were using. I said, there's nothing that beats the old good old piece of paper. How many dials have I made today? How many appointments have I made? How many, how many contracts did I get today? You better have your numbers. You better know how many you dial, how many to, to get somebody on the phone for a contact. Then you need those contacts into actual conversations that are meaningful, yep. then you have to have those meaningful conversations turn into hopefully appointments booked. And when you book the appointments, what's the no show rate on the, if you don't know all of your numbers and I don't want to give a seminar here, but my point is you reminded me, my brother of some of that basic stuff because I was riding a little highs. Like I got all these people pulling at me in all these different directions now. And it's a blessing. Don't get me wrong. I love sure. it. But you kind of sometimes forget to take care of the little things. And, and you got me refocused, my man, on just doing some of the little things. So I well, don't yeah. believe in the second that the, all the contributions coming from your leaders above, it's people within our own organization that we get that, that oh my God, I could talk all day about it. Man, I, I want to pick some I of this apart. Of Dude, this is amazing. This is, I, put, I got so many notes from all of that. Like, so let's work backwards. So what you just said about the basics and the fundamentals, 
I love sports. I'm a sports guy. So I use analogies all the time on sports. Who wins championships? Is it the guys that win the dunk contest? If you are a basketball fan, the guys that win the dunk contest aren't even in the all-star game most of the time, right? Because all this show, all of these things that people are uh, strive to be don't win championships. Those aren't winners. It's that old the, saying, there's no I in team. That's right. And the winners, like go back to, uh, I'm not really a fan of them, but you have to admire them. Back to the Spurs when they were on their run. Coach Pop, yeah. there was nothing sexy about their offense, but they were the best at the fundamentals, right? Yeah. And the fundamentals. The defense, I recall. Yep. Yeah. Defense and fundamentals win championships. Yep. That correlates in sports. No sports fan will deny that. But why don't why do we think we can outthink ourselves in business? Why do we focus? You called it, I don't remember what you called it, but I call it shiny object syndrome. Oh, there's this cool ideal over here. You call it squirrely. Yeah. So there's this shiny object over here. I'm gonna go pick it up and play with it, right? No, focus on what works. What I've learned over the years and what you said is work works. And you I call it R and D. I'm a chief R and D. I know everything that you're doing in your organization. I'm going to pick and plug things that you were doing that is working, that Adam's doing, that other people in our network are doing, and I'm going to apply it in my business. Because it's not recreating the wheel. It's going all in on the fundamentals. And it is making those little tweaks on the things that work to improve that percentage by 5%. What can you do to improve that just a little bit today and then a little bit tomorrow? And then over time, your whole world changes. It's the basic stuff. It's the fundamentals. I also have done, you mentioned like you go to a seminar. We have all of these, most um, high D personalities or leaders have this flaw, right? You go to a seminar, you have all these notes, you come back, what do you do? Hey guys, we're changing everything. We're gonna rip up the playbook and we're gonna do this, right? Like that's what everybody does. But what you do in your organization and what I've realized is that causes whiplash. Yeah. People, not everybody in an organization thinks like us. And thank God they don't, right? It, could you imagine what chaos it would be? Um, but they need focus. They need a playbook. They need, here's what wins. And so create that playbook and remind them the little tweaks, the little things that they can do better so it can be duplicatable and it can be scalable. That's how you truly build a business. Um, and also ideas are worthless. I remember back in high school, they had knowledge is power written everywhere. They were wrong. Knowledge is useless, useless without implementation. So knowledge is useless. Im applying that knowledge is the true power. Piggyback on that, practice doesn't make perfect. Nope. Perfect practice makes perfect. Somebody can practice their scripts and dialogues and their, and, and their rebuttals in real estate because they're all about the same things you know people about what what a buyer prospective buyer is going to tell you or what a prospective seller is going to tell you it's how you respond to questions first of all i learned a long time ago that anybody that's listening to this today i want to give them maybe the biggest tip that you can ever give anybody is the shortest course in selling is ask questions and listen if you ask people enough questions they will tell you what it is that they need and how and why they need it and why it's important to them and why it's why that is important to them and if you go deep enough in your question answering or asking and 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 and, and find out you're going to get to the, the 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 point where there's no possible chance they won't work with you if their timing and their motivation is there and you bring out their emotion yep. and get to what it is that they really are looking for, you will separate yourself from anybody they've ever spoken to in real estate, car sales. I don't care any kind of sales. It's yep. really what it's all about because, um, and I, I think I'll give credit where credit's due. I heard this from a guy named Jack Daly and he's not even involved in the real estate business, but I went to a seminar of his years ago. He was in the lending industry. Uh, but he did. He said, shortest course in selling, ask questions and listen. If you called my sales manager right now and asked Bert Jones, what is the shortest course in selling? I'll promise you, Bert will tell you. In fact, just call him on the phone and ask him. Just And then I, I promise you he'll know the answer because we have never not repeated that. And again, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know it. Somebody gave it to me. And that's the beautiful thing about what we're building and why I love what we're doing more now than anything 
Because I, the money game is already won for us. We've been very blessed, and I, I, I'm telling you, we worked hard for it as well. But we've been blessed to have so many people that are getting it. I don't think that that we really have anything to worry about there anymore. Now it's like, how many more lives can we impact? How many more people can we change? I got back from build at our event with Tony Robbins and realized I was. How amazing was that event, by the way? Huh? How amazing was that event? Oh goodness. I mean, well, the fact that it's not every day Tony Robbins grabs your big bald dome that I have. Dude, that was so funny. <laughs> and then he puts a big kiss on the top of my head. But you know, he's I've been following Tony since the uh, since the 80s, right out of the army. When I got out of the army, I used to drive up and down the road with cassette tapes back then, listening to Tony Robbins when my friends were more concerned about where they're gonna go grab their next beer or 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 you know what party we're gonna go attend. Uh, and then they wanted to listen to music and I made them listen to uh, self-help uh, cassette tapes and and things. So, uh, but Tony was the first guy that I, I set up one night and, and watched uh, on television. He really intrigued me. And so I got this whole thing of his cassette tapes. I think it was called Awake the, the, the Giant Within or something like yep. that. And, and, and it just evolved into, you know what, I, 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 I'm, I'm digging what this guy's selling here. I'm, I'm digging what he's saying. And I didn't really have a mentor. My father, I love my father, but I'm I'm, I'm talking about a business mentor. My dad is a was a factory worker at 3M for 35 years. He raised all five of us kids and did a hell of a job. And I wouldn't trade my father for anything. Uh, but I didn't get any guidance from sales. Uh, I didn't go to college. I didn't meet anybody else. I was in the army. So when I got out of it, I had to start finding the answers out on my own. And I knew that if I hung around successful people, if I read enough books, that I could pick up some tips from people that were successful. And man, you just got to copy. That's how I met Russell Shaw. I read about Russell Shaw in the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book. And even today, I, well, he probably doesn't even remember, but years ago, I, 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 I saw Gary Keller and I and I went to, up to him at Keller Williams and I thanked him in person. And he goes, what are you thanking me for? I said, I want to thank you for making us into the, the agents that we are today and we're not even in your company. He said, how'd that happen? I said, because I read your red book, The Millionaire Real Estate Agent, yeah. and I read the interviews that were done with your top agents. And then I reached out to those top agents and I said, I don't have a lot of money. My wife and I are just starting a team, but I promise you we'll never be in your backyard and compete against you with our team. If I could just come up there to your place, be a fly on the wall, I'll, I'll make a donation to your charity. I can only give you a thousand dollars or 2000 bucks. That's all I can afford. But if you'll let me come and spend a half a day with you and interview you, and then you could uh, maybe share what we're doing or what you're doing, and I could share what we're doing, maybe something really cool could happen out of this. And I promise I'll never compete with you. And uh, you know what? Russell said yes to that. And he was That's pretty awesome. cautious when we first met. But then after we met, we're in Tucson. He's up in Phoenix. Man, the guy laid everything out to us. He was proud to tell us what it was and, and what he was doing that was successful. People love to talk about what they've done that are successful if they know that your heart's in the right place. And, uh, and I believe I gave Russell a check and Russell handed it back to me the second time we got together. He goes, man, I don't need your money. That's what That's winners awesome. do. And so, right. that, so I only say that story because that's where we're at with EXP. When people reach out to me, man, I don't need their money. I want to help them because I, all I feel, I look at it like I'm paying it back or paying it forward or whatever. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm, I feel like I'm rambling now, but I got no, it goes, it, all that goes back to all that just goes back to contribution. That's just who you are, right? And that's that's why you've built what you've built. Um, there's so much I want to unpack there. Um, you said practice doesn't make perfect. So Jeff, you're a golfer. Right, so you'll understand this analogy. When people say, "Well, practice makes perfect," if you go to the driving range and you're there hitting balls for three hours, is there any way that you can leave the driving range worse than when you got there? A hundred percent. Absolutely. If you're practicing the wrong things. Yes. So practice doesn't make perfect. You have to practice the right things in the right order, and then you you actually make progress. Right. I say perfect practice makes perfect. Yep. But I love that driving range example because people can actually relate to that, right? But just because you're hitting balls doesn't mean you're learning anything. And it can be something as easy as people think just putting on a putting green. Just making putts over and over and over and over on a straight putt, that's easy. But when you start getting these the, the greens that have different undulation, and I look at that like it's going to curve to the left or it's going to curve to the right. Well, when you look at that, or how much downhill is it? How much uphill is the putt? 
those are all just different variations. Well, when you're talking to a buyer or you're talking to a prospective seller, they're all going to just give you variations. But you need to know how to handle that variation. So if it's a right to left putt, are you going to aim straight at the hole? Or are you going to aim a little right of the of, of the hole when you're making that putt? Yep. And 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 then how far right do you need to aim? Well, you know what? The same thing works on a script with with a buyer. You know, are you thinking about making a move? No. Well, uh, well, I don't know yet. Well, if you were to move, you stay in the area, you move it away. I don't know. When do you think that might be? I'm, I'm establishing timing and motivation. I'd love to just call you on the phone and say, hey, Matt, are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? Yeah. <laughs> they're not going to like that response. They're, they're going to need me to ask a few questions, man. And then and then once I find out, so tell me, uh, you know, if you were to stay in the area, uh, you know, what's got you making a move? And uh, well, you know, we're, we're, we're honestly, we're talking about expanding the family, but, you know, in fact, we're past talking about it. my wife's three months pregnant and we're, and we're going to be, we need a bigger home. Great. So why is that important to you? Well, when I was a kid, uh, we, we were all crammed up in the same bedroom and I, we've got a, we've got a youngster right now, but we don't want the baby in the same bed. Well, so why is that important? Because I want the kids in separate rooms. I, I, I didn't like that. So look at man. Now, anytime that they say that they're on the fence and they don't want to go look at home, say, remember, you don't want to share a bedroom. You don't want your kids sharing a bedroom. You told me about it. And that's just one little example. Yep. But they're telling you what's important to them, why it's important. And now you're going to go find them that house with the appropriate amount of bedrooms. I don't know if that makes sense. No, that makes total sense. Dude, that's such a great analogy because I'm, I'm a pretty simple guy. And so my definition of sales is solving problems. If you want to be a good salesperson, be good at solving problems. But most salespeople fail because they forget the old rule of two ears, one mouth. Yeah. You, you were supposed to ask twice, as, listen twice as much as you talk. Yep. Sales is not talking, too many people as sales agents talk at people and not to people. You need to ask great questions. Sales is not about what you say, it's about what you ask. And you get to know them. And I have a saying I say all, all the time around my office, the what doesn't matter. It's the why that's behind the what. So if you don't get to the why, you wasted the conversation. It doesn't matter what, pro like, let's use this analogy, just role play it. Like how many agents hang up on the client on acts, not literally, but they, they do, because they're talking about, oh, 123 Main Street, that house on 123 Main Street. And that client's no longer interested in that property. The agent's stuck. They don't know where to go. But what about why were they interested in 123 Main Street? What did they like about the property? Why was that important to them and their family? Now, when you have that motivation, now you can build a, establish a connection and a relationship, build that rapport, and then you can truly help that person. But if you focus on the what, it, you cannot go anywhere. You're just an order taker. And if you really want to help people, you want to be a good salesperson, figure out how you can get, get great at figuring out the true problem, the root of the problem, and then solve it, and you will make all the sales in the world. So Matt, to piggyback on that, and that's such a great point, but when somebody's calling on 123 Main Street, what comes out of my mouth, and hopefully it comes out of every agent's uh, mouths on our team, is that, yes, while I'm looking that up, let me ask you a question if it's okay. Are you only interested in this property or are other properties in, uh, of similar nature of interest to you as well? Uh, because many of our properties you won't even find on the MLS or diving around on all these, digging around all these websites or driving all over town. I might be able to save you a whole lot of time and effort. Uh, and, and so that way you're not wasting a bunch of gas or a lot of your time looking on websites where the homes are, are already sold or under contract. Yep. And then you're going to get 18 other real estate agents call you and be beating you up. I mean, I could save you from all that pain if you're interested. Would you like to know more about the other properties as well? Yep. Well, yeah, I would, you know, and then boom, now you've got these people engaged with you and you've got more than that one house. But again, Matt, it's asking questions, it's listening, getting them to buy in. And then when, now I got, I'm in a dialogue with them. So what's got you making the move, man? Yep. Tell me a little bit more about your situation. I, again, ask questions, go deeper, get the why. I'm trying to find out that why. And I'm not trying anything. Bob would frequenting you know, see that. <laughs> he pulls his hat. hat exactly he's got his tri hat his drill sergeant <laughs> i'm not trying anything i'm getting to their why and when i get to their why then i know what it's going to take and and the the magic is for us to let everybody else that's hearing this today understand that whether they come to our company or not at exp which you know that'd be great if they reach out and want to know more about it but you know what just look at if you want to learn how to sell real estate 
you just need to get with people that have been there, done that, and got the T-shirt. I, I just hate to say it. Yep. There's a lot of people running around right now that have been in business about one or two years, and the market's been, I mean, anybody could sell in a market that's red hot and you get multiple offers and da da da. It's 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 fine as somebody that's been through the market when it was slow and then when it's fast and then it gets slow again and then it gets fast. I mean, we just keep evolving because we go, you know, the last time we had a massive slowdown when there was all those bank foreclosures and REOs and all that stuff. We didn't know anything about that, but I didn't care. I found out and I went out and found out who I need to talk to to yep. get into that world. So if it ever comes back into that market again, we're we're already there for that market. Or if it's short sales or or wherever we go, we just ebb, we flow, we, we make sure we stay ahead of it. Because if you stay in your own little corner of the world and you don't get out and start talking to people and making friends all over the place or having network, holy crap, I can take care, you want to know power. And yeah, of course you already know this, but if I want to know what's going on around the country, having the access of 5,000 agents in one text message, how's your market conditions? Report back and then where, you know, how are they? Uh, shoot me a quick text back. I'm dying to know and then what city you're in. And then I send a blast like that. I can find out everywhere what's going on. Yep. And by the way, I can also have an amazing database of, of people to refer business to that I know close transactions because I know the ones that are in our network that are selling and the ones that aren't selling a lot. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> You know, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm sorry. You're no, probably, no, this you know. is great. So there's a couple things I want to unpack is number one, R&D. Make sure, don't, don't recreate the wheel. Right. Success leaves clues. 100%. Follow people that have been there and done that. Like one of the reasons I'm doing this podcast, I'm doing this is to give back to agents because I think there's so many people out there giving the wrong information. They're trying to sell a shiny object. It's the, like the Instagram entrepreneur that goes and leases the car because they can't afford it. And the only reason they're able to afford to lease the car is because they sell you a course on how to buy a car, but they never have done it themselves, right? Like how many real estate agents are in that, that haven't actually went through this change, that don't understand truly what the fundamentals are and how to maximize those, how to pass that on to your agents, how to build a true real estate team, how to build a true network of 5,000 people. That is so, so powerful is you have to be in alignment with the right people. And so there's a saying out there, your network equals your net worth. And I am where I am today because of my network, because of people like you, because of people like Adam, because of people like John Cheplak that are fortunate to be in my network, in my circles and being around you guys. Like literally I have skipped so many steps because you paved the way ahead of time. Adam paved the way ahead of time. And as I was growing my team, growing my organization, as my agents were having struggles, you guys helped solve that problem before I took the wrong path. And when you're able to have the cheat code to what is happening in this market because of people like you in our network, it is not fair. Like literally, we have such an unfair advantage. Yeah. In, in partnership with great people like you because we know how to get through this market. How many agents right now are like panicked? They don't know what to do, they're frozen. Like, I'm excited. If we question, and we do from time to time, we question even what we're doing because I'm always questioning. I think you always gotta qu ask yourself questions. Always. About where you are and, and you gotta do, I mean, you know, Brent Gove, our, our, our sponsor and, and partner, has always told me that the uh, the world's biggest room uh, that there is, is the room for improvement. And if you're not looking for th ways to improve what you're doing, I think you're crazy. And so you gotta always look for holes or gaps or things that, you know, what's going on. And the market shifts, it's like, that's why I called you. I'm like, look at man, I keep seeing and hearing about all this great success that Matt Smith and his team are having. Um, you know, what is going on? What are we not doing that we should be doing? And you reminded me just in that, that network, that's the power here. You reminded me after talking to me for a little bit, asking a few questions and listening, you let me tell you that basically we weren't holding our agents accountable like we used to, but we also couldn't hold them accountable if they weren't completely bought into the five dysfunctions of a team and, and the right culture. Yep. Because how are you going to hold people accountable when they don't even know that's one of the core values that you have on your team? 
you know, they, they want the accountability factor, right? And when we asked those questions, you know how many of them said that, that they wanted that? Almost every single one of them. It was crazy what the, what they wanted us to keep doing. Yep. And then when they tell you that, man, did last or yesterday I had a great I, I had a great meeting with them. And I go, now you asked for it. So we're going to be holding you all yep. accountable. And you it's know what? their idea to hold for you to hold them accountable. 100%. Yeah. It, it was the greatest. And I, I, I don't know if that was Chep that had that initially. We heard it. But I listened to him. And he's an amazing baller dude, John Cheplak. I'm telling you, he's one of the greatest dudes I've ever met, uh, and especially in our industry. And But he practices what he preaches because he's always working out. He's making himself, you know, he looks good. He's not just talking the talk. You know, yep. he's walking the walk, right? So. The thing is, I went and I sat in a, I don't know, I probably paid two or three thousand bucks to sit in a in a couple day deal in Las Vegas. There was only 40 or 50 people there, that other agents. And and I listened to an entire exercise that Daniel Beer did on uh on EOS and and uh the entrepreneur operating system. And I, him and uh, Deborah Beagle talked about yep. it. And I came back and that was one I'm like, guys, gals, we got to implement that. And that was been a couple of years ago. And, and now every Thursday is our L10 meeting. I mean, we're, we got to go through our quarterly rocks, our annual rocks. You probably got it right behind you. Rocket fuel. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Yeah. Attraction. Yeah. Either one yep. rocket fuel or attraction. Yeah, we've got that too. Yep. Dude, dude, I'm telling you that made all the difference in the world, uh, with structure on the team and, and staying on, on, on milestones and, and I, on all the things that we do. But it, we had to go back even further. Excuse me. We had to go back. I'm knocking my microphone around. We had to go back even further um, and realize that you can't even do any of that if you're not getting back to your basic culture on your team. And so I, I, I mean it, man. I, I, I feel like that we're all rowing in the same direction. And when we were down in Puerto Rico, my team, our team, Marcy and I, our, our team started, um, you know, we were work, we were focused on a different mission, which was helping agents with EXP and our business at in Tucson was still doing great, but it wasn't like, it wasn't getting, it wasn't keep improving year over year, over year, over year. It was just kind of staying about the same, which with us not being involved more than a week, an hour a week in our business, a lot of people like to be in that position. Sure. But I'm not that guy. I, I kind of want to keep improving. And then when they got back up here, I, I realized what it was what was going on it was is that i lost touch of accountability i stopped holding my leaders accountable for those numbers and i stopped asking the 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 real questions about you know what are we doing for training what's our onboarding look like you know who's you who's stopped going? you stopped inspecting what you expect 100% that's a great way of putting it i i stopped inspecting what i was expecting and that was a big mistake man i mean you What's the point of having all this, all these salaries and all this payroll and all these people that are helping you if they're just, I guess there's a lot to be said about just keeping things from going down. But look at if you're not striving to get better and they're not striving to get better, eventually they're going to get tired of being there. Yep. They're going to go somewhere else. Somebody's going to have a shiny object and lure them away. And then you're going to wake up one day and nobody's going to be there. You got to always look to make yourself better. You know, Mike Gerbic is a perfect example. The dude is a triathlete. And uh, I mean, when he is training, he's always looking to go out and beat his previous time. Sure. Now, there might be a day that Mike's running or, or decides he doesn't want to swim two miles and run 26 miles and do all the stuff that triathletes do. But I can tell you right now, I can't even personally go out and run two miles without having to stop and walk. I'm working on that. But you know what? You got to work on your diet. You got to yep. get, you know, I got to take more weight off. I feel like that I'm doing better. But I started to tell you, I came back from Tony Robbins and build and the, it was, it was really our EXP event, but Tony was there. And I made up my mind that I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I was 275 pounds, uh, 279 pounds when I got back a month ago. I've already, I'm already down 24 pounds and, Man, and, that's and, awesome. and like, well, actually five weeks. And I'm eating right and I'm going and I'm working out. And I've and I've got Brian Colhane at EXP. He's one of the co-founders. He's already introduced me to people. He got me in touch with Gary Brecca at 10X Health that was on stage with us. And, and Gary Brecca uh, is personally coaching Dana White. And now Gary Brecca is personally coaching me. And I'm looking at some of this stuff and I'm going, holy smokes, man, you got the money game on. You better win the health game because if you're not around the health, 
you don't have energy and you're not healthy. Well, first of all, if you're not healthy, you don't have no, you have, and if, and if you're not healthy, you're not ever going to be around long enough to enjoy all the money that you're making. Yep. And you can't go impact more lives and nobody's going to listen to a fat ass. I'm sorry if you got to edit that out, but that's so true. No, all good. No, it's, it's right. You have to, like you said about, like you were talking about Chef as an example. People respect him because I got a gallon of water. I got to get through today. That's right. People respect Chep because he walks the walk, right? You have to, if you're going to talk the talk, you need to walk the walk. And we're not perfect. We all slip, right? But um, I had a two year slippage of reading my own press clippings just a little bit and, uh, and getting busy being busy, Mm. but not allowing enough scheduled time on my daily schedule for my body. And then not allowing myself the discipline that, you know, okay, I'm busy. It's okay if I eat a bag. Everything that ended in O's all last summer, I ate Cheetos, Fritos, <laughs> Fritos Tostitos. I mean, it, it, and I'm going to tell you right now, if it ends in O's, stay away from it. Cause it's <laughs> <That's> so, funny. <laughs> maybe Cheerios with, with, with some fruit is okay. But I don't know <laughs> That's much hilarious. Those, but I, I digress. And these people are probably like, come on, man, talk about something I don't know. <laughs> so um, I want to talk about, so there's a couple things I want to circle back to. You talked about culture, right? And I could, I read body language. Your energy when you talked about when you came back and you poured in and you do this exercise, dude, your whole body changed. Like your energy that you were pouring out because of the change that happened in your culture. And too many people as a leader try to come in and they're the oppressive thumb as a leader. Like that's why I, I love our conversation when we had that conversation is because you realize that you can't come in and get, you can't make people successful. You can facilitate the environment for them to choose to be successful. But if they're happy, they're motivated, they know, they know where the guardrails are as far as the values, what's expected, what the standards are, and more importantly, how that's going to help them fulfill their dreams for them and their families, and you have motivated, inspired people for themselves, like, watch out. That's how you grow a culture. And five dysfunctions of a team, it's required reading to be on this organization. You, you, you read it. We read it as a team once a year, together. And we study, hey, chapter one, what was your takeaways? Chapter two, what was your takeaways? And we all re-emphasize because it is that crucial. Without culture, nothing else matters. If you don't keep your culture intact, then I don't care what lead source you have. I don't care how many agents you recruit. It, it will come to an end if you don't have your culture intact. So culture always has to come first. And five dysfunctions of a team, if you have not read that in your organization, you need it. It will it'll walk you through it. You also mentioned EOS. EOS model entrepreneur operating system has changed the transition of our business. We run our business like a business now. Too many real estate agents don't. I highly recommend that you look into that. If you guys need help on that, as you're listening to this, reach out to me. I'm happy to, to, to walk you through that. Uh, Jeff mentioned Rocket Fuel is a great book. There's also a book called Traction. Um, those kind of explain it. Um, also, one that I just finished with my leadership team is Four Disciplines of Execution. Jeff, I don't know if you've read that or not, but I highly recommend it. You want to talk about four disciplines of execution. It's similar to EOS. It's kind of an operating system. Um, We're going to still run EOS, but we're going to use the, 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 the takeaways from four disciplines of execution to actually execute on those things. Like there's too many good ideas. Whenever we talk, man, because now I got another homework assignment. (laughs) I'm going to read it. Um, All right. So I'm going to wrap this up. Jeff. Let me just tell you this. I want to show you something. Yeah. I I was planning on having this to replace my, uh, I'm proud of EXP, but I wanted to get some different logos. I don't know if you can even see this. Yeah, dude, I'm proud of this. I just ordered this thing. It's my new, it's my new American Express card. Dude, that is awesome. So, so, so what it says, and I don't know if the, if the camera's even picking this up, but it says American Dream. Make your own luck. Hustling since 1976, baby. Jeff Willems. Uh, you know, uh, ballot, ballot through uh, January, or, or excuse me, June of 2090. So I, I, you know, I'm planning on being around a long time, man. I, mean, I know it. that, you know, I'm, I'm 56 years old. So, so 2090 means I got to live to about 135 years old or whatever. But I know that I would never do it if I, I would never be able to do it if I don't get that health right. But I had to order that because I'm going to put that up behind me and, and let people know that you have to make your own luck. Yep. You can't say you want to, you, you, you know, you, you're going to try to do this or you're plan. you know, you're, you're, you know, I, I don't know what, I don't know. You fail to plan, you plan to fail, man. You've got to get this right. You've got the number one word in the world behind you, persistence. If you don't have persistence 
and you're not willing, if you get smacked in the face and you get told no or how, whatever, you get knocked down, man, you got to get back up. If I told everybody here on this call, and I, I don't mind telling them, dude, I've been so broke, I couldn't even pay attention. When the yep. trash man came by, I mean, literally after Marcy and I first got married, if, if the trash man was coming by, I would literally want to ask that dude to leave three bags. I mean, that's how bad things were for us. I, I know from um, from from what, what it was like when, when we literally were diving. I, not Marcy, she never did this, but we were so hungry and I was too proud to go get on welfare or food stamps or any of that kind of stuff. And it was about another four days until I was going to get my first paycheck. And she was... I think she was about um, at the time, six and a half months pregnant with our first baby. And then he didn't make it. And unfortunately, and, and I can tell you that I, I never have forgiven myself quite for that because I, I think part of it might've been her not having the, uh, the, the nutrition that she needed because really all we could afford to put on her, on the table at the time was she had some prenatal vitamins that we were able to get a friend of hers loaned her or gave her whatever, but then we we're eating potatoes any way, shape or form that you could. But I went out one night because I knew as a kid, I worked at, a, at McDonald's and I knew that after about 10 minutes of food sitting in the, in the, in the little things that they put the food down in back in the day, you know, I just, they would yeah. put the sandwiches in a little tray that kind of come down. And if they stood, stood up there under the, under the heat lamp, more than 10 minutes, they had to take them out of the window and then they would put them in a, in a bag all the food would go into one bag and usually there would be a farmer that would come around and pick them up or somebody in, at least in my hometown in Indiana, they'd come by and they'd feed that stuff to their hogs, you know, and, and they would just have a contract. <clears throat> well, I knew a lot of the McDonald's had the same thing and either they were picked up or if they didn't pick them up, they threw that one bag of food would be in a dumpster. Dude, one night I went down there with my buddy Scott in, in, uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico uh, Scott Hayden, I couldn't even tell you where Scott's at today, but Scott was letting Marcy and I live with them. And this is right after I got out of the army and we were all hungry. And I'm like, dude, I, I'm not going to go get, I'm, I'm too proud. I won't do this. I was looking for pop bottles on the side of the road, man. I was, I was, maybe I'm boring your people with this story, but I want them no, to great. understand this is, this is who I am. I would not ask for a handout. I was too proud to call my dad and ask him for money or anybody else we're going to get through it. It's only four more days. We can make it happen. Hell, I mean, you know, we could fast if we have to. I could, you know, but I got really hungry. So I die. I, I go up over this fence where they had the dumpster and all the food for a McDonald's in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. And I had Scott throw a five gallon bucket up over the top. And it was like after they closed late at night. And uh, so he throws the bucket over and I dive into the dumpster and I pull out this bag of, uh, of uh, food and it was all that's back when they put the, the 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 sandwiches were still in these styrofoam containers. And, you know, now it's all paper. You know, I don't know if I have the guts to do it today, but they were in the styrofoam container still. Man, I pulled out Big Macs and quarter pounders of cheese and filet of fish sandwiches. And I mean, you name it, there were it was, it was that bag was packed. I put them uh, I put them in the five gallon bucket and I kind of threw it up to Scott to where they wouldn't all dump over. They was kind of, you know, I keep trying to keep it balanced. And so I threw it up over the top of the fence and he caught it on the way down. We lost a few of them, but we got back to the house and man, we were warming up burgers and, and all this stuff out of the dumpster. <laughs> and, but Marcy still wouldn't eat them. She goes, you can tell that story all you want, but you make sure you tell people I never ate them. <laughs> and I did. And our bulldogs did because we had two bulldogs and they ate the hell out of them. But, but I'm telling you, it wasn't real fun. And, 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 and I could tell you it was hard and hot to go out and try to find uh, soda bottles on the side of the road and turn those in for money. But I knew we could get those if we went out and did enough work. Man, I'm going to tell you something. Every time I start thinking about how great I have it and how successful we are and how, how easy the world has gotten, when I need motivation, I think back to those days I'm never, ever in my life going back there again. And I'm saying, I'm saying to anybody that's listening to me right now, if you want, to, you want drive and you want motivation, you want something inside you that you need to have snap and get you to think about being successful, you need to take yourself to the deepest, darkest place you've ever been in your life when you're the most down and out. And you need to put that thought in your brain. And this is Tony Robbins coming in. You, it's all about the figure eight of emotions and you take yourself down there and let yourself really understand how painful that was and why you don't want to be there. And you will find the energy. You will find the, the drive to get up off the mat 
and go out there and build something and not be feeling sorry for yourself. I'm telling you, man, that's all I do. Maybe it won't work for everybody, but that's what works for me is I, I take myself to a place I never want to ever go again. Dude, thousand percent. Thank you for sharing that story. And so, I'm sorry. To no, don't be sorry, man. That was great stuff. And it's so true. Like I can relate so much. So first episode of this podcast, me and my wife spent two and a half hours telling our story and our struggles. And like, Jeff, I don't know if you've heard it or not, but part of our story was there was a time I had my six week old firstborn daughter in the hospital to visit her mom. They locked me out of the hospital. They came out in hazmat suits and says, you can't go in. I, I don't take no for an answer. I got in, I had to put on the suit. They said, we'll let you in, but we're only letting you in to say goodbye. You have 24 hours to tell her goodbye. She's dying. What? She pulled through, everything's good, but that's part of our story. That's my dark spot. I'm never going, and before that, you wanna talk about being broke? All we had was diapers and formula that other people got. My, I, I was too proud too. You and I are way, that's why I relate so much. <laughs> my uncle came over to visit his niece at that time, right, my daughter, um, and looked in the fridge to get something. He was gonna get a snack. Cuss me out from one side, up one side, down the other. You can't live like that. We had nothing in the fridge, right? We just couldn't afford it. We had electric bills stacking up. I'm like, I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out, right? So I can relate so much to that story. Um, and it's you can use that as fuel. You can use it as fuel or use it as an excuse. I call it victim or victor. I choose to be a victor. I I, I own everything in my Funny, life. I never really thought about that. Is it victor or what do you call it? Victim or victor? There's victor, too many people that have victor, the, yeah. that vic, victim mentality. Well, life happened to me. Well, all, I'm not where I want to be in life because of him, her, or all, whatever circumstance. What you and I have in common is we used those, those trials, those tribulations, those struggles as fuel to never go back. Right. And that is what we use to continue to strive to be better because we made that choice. Well, I truly think that, um, that what's exciting now, and I think maybe it's being 56, I feel like a dinosaur in our business at times now, you know, because we got in it so early, but well, pretty early on. I mean, you know, we were over 18 years ago. Before that, it was 14 years as a certified mortgage planner. I mean, there's been a lot that's happened in in Marcy and I's life. Uh, um, you know that, um, yeah, I don't know, just just a path of being around the industry. Sure. But I, I, I can just tell you, man, I'm getting more joy out of being able to share some of this wisdom because if I if we can just make somebody's life a little easier yep. to get to that point. So they don't have to go through a lot of the uh, trials and tribulations and, and wasting money and and all this time. And I mean, because time is so precious. And if I could do anything and we all can't, but if I could, I'd like to go get 10 more years back of my life. Yep. And, and I know had I opened my brain or opened my mind first, then allowed myself to drop my ego you know, because I think the ego is the biggest mistake, the biggest thing that I really had, even up until, heck, I still fight it today at times. Sure. I mean, if I'm being honest, I do. Um, but the most expensive thing in the world that you can have or or, or, or fault is is an ego. Yep. So, you know, if you will, if you were just listen to, to what people are trying to tell you or not trying, people are telling you that, sorry, Bob. Uh, you know, but, but you know what I'm saying? I mean, if you listen to what they're, what they're teaching, you can, you can save yourself a lot of pain and suffering. And so we, we took what I considered to be the shortcut approach. Yeah. And, 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 and let me tell you, it could have been a lot shorter had I not, when I first started becoming successful, started reading my own press clippings yep. and, you know, worried about how much recognition Remax was giving us and whether they were, you know, and they were doing a lot with us back in the day. They were flying Marcy and, around, Marcy and I around and, and putting us on the Remax satellite network and all this kind of stuff. But then I started a coaching company because I thought I was, hell, I knew it all. Guess what, man? I was just starting to figure it out. And I see that today. And that's where I was going about 30 minutes ago. I, I you know, I, I see a hundred coaches out here now or a thousand yep. coaches. It seems like there was a great, there's one uh, there's a coach for every good agent that's out there now today but i can tell you that's what a good market does you want somebody to you want a mentor that has been through all of the markets 100 you know you know nothing john snow i mean i'm telling you people need to understand they know nothing i know nothing john snow 
Yep. I'm going to listen to the old mice or what is this, the Meister or whatever the guy's name is, you know, that's been around a hundred years. Cause that's who, that's, who's got all the knowledge, man. hundred percent. Yeah. And so let's, I'm going to wrap this up, Jeff, dude, thank you so much for taking the time to be with me today. And thank like, you, I want to end for everything that you and your team does. And, and, uh, heck, we got to do some team functions together, man. Even for sure. if it's by zoom, we, but we got to do some, do some script offs and stuff. That'd be great. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm down. Sign me up. All right. um, it's we. I appreciate you. We would not be where we're at without you. You've been a huge part of our journey, so I appreciate you. Um, and I think going back to what you were saying, like um, really contributing and making an impact on people's lives and following the right people that have been there and done that. Like, I just want to end on this. That is the true power of our network. It really is. Like, I'm living proof. Like, we are fortunate enough to be number eight ranked team in the nation, number one in the state of Missouri because of this network, because we were able to follow proven playbooks and skip steps and do things because other people paved the way. And in this network, we're contributors and we share and we help each other. And so if you're struggling out there, if you're worried about this market changing, if you're worried about the shift, the normalization of the marketplace, um, reach out to us. Jeff, I'm, I know Jeff as a contributor would love to help. I always would love to help. So anything that we can do to help, um, Jeff, I signed you up for that. I hope that's okay. Um, but I know, I know your heart. I know you're a contributor. And if anybody wants to reach out, um, how, do you, how do you want them to reach out to you? Well, I just like to, like, yeah, I think the best thing that people can do is shoot me an email to Jeff at Willems.com. It's W-I-L-H-E-M-S. I know it sounds like or looks like Will Helms, but it's really Willems, W-I-L-H-E-M-S. So Jeff at Willems.com. Uh, or they can shoot me a text. I, that's fine too, 520-250-9477. Uh, but more importantly, just please reach out and let me know where you heard of this so then I can do what I think is the right thing to do is, is at least get Matt involved in the conversation with us because uh, you're my business partner, pal, and I, I want you to continue to thrive and, and succeed and at the highest levels. And I know you will because that's who you are. But but I also want to make sure that uh, if people are hearing about it, this is this is you that took the uh, the uh, the time and energy to record a a, a podcast here and and uh, so uh, I but I will say this anybody that decides that they 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 want more help uh, there's no strings attached you don't need to change brands we're here to help you man we're brand agnostic uh, let us just be of uh, of value to you in your life if you feel that that something we said today resonates reach out man we want to help that's that's all I can really say. Absolutely. We're going to end on that, Jeff. Thank you so much again. Guys, if you found any value in this episode, um, reach out to us. We'd love to help you. But also, we're doing this to help other people. We're, help, we're doing this to make our industry better. So the only other thing I ask, this is free. This doesn't cost you anything. I know you got value from the, uh, the monster that Jeff is in this industry. Share this with a friend that you think this will help them as well. Thank you guys so much for listening. Jeff, thanks again. And guys, we'll catch you next time. You got it, buddy. My pleasure. 